I recorded just a second too late there. <laughs> Catch that. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the No Boring Stories podcast. I am Alex Street, and I'm joined here by somebody who makes me smile, makes me laugh. We always have a good conversation, always get right into the goods, into the depth. And I'm so excited to have you here on the podcast. Yessi Chavez, how are you today? I'm doing great, and I'm so, so excited to be here. Oh, this is great. Um, <laughs> look, we have, I mean, we've been talking for 20 minutes already. It's kind of like sometimes we get on a call and it's right down to business. All right, let's hit record. But for you and I, again, we just, we've been talking about all kinds of stuff of human design and you making fun of me not knowing the main character of Good Will Hunting, which is in a past podcast episode. Uh, we've talked about, I don't know, just where we're at in life and everything already. And I'm like, we need to, we need to set this up. I should actually hit record. This is the good stuff. This yeah. is where we're at. So, okay. Something that we did mention you. Yeah. You said you were listening to a past, uh, no boring stories podcast episode where I was talking with Andrew Hovelson and we were kind of just shooting back and forth about acting. And I was talking specifically about my experience with auditions in commercial acting. You said that you've done some of that. So tell me about that. How, when was this? What past life or is this part of your current life? What was that little, what was that moment? It's definitely pat, part of my past life. Uh -huh. um, I did it from 2014 through 2016. And it was something that came to me because one of my yoga students he told me that I should do commercial acting. He set me up with an agent mm -hmm. and I thought, this is great. Um, I can make a lot of money <laughs> from working one day. So I started going to these commercials and really quickly, I was like, what am I supposed to do? I was so confused. They were like, eat this bowl of cereal. Like it's the <laughs> most delicious thing you've ever had in your entire life, but keep it natural. Yeah, but don't overact. <laughs> Yeah. Gosh. I was like, what is happening? So I kept going because every single audition was different, but I just felt, I felt like super goofy. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, what is this? Like, why am I doing this? So I can be in a 30 second commercial where I have to literally like pause and be like that's me that's me yeah exactly yeah or <laughs> eclipse it is it is one of the great I mean maybe this is just you know a little bit of my my arrogance showing up but I do love it when somebody in like California texts me a, a picture and is like is this you in this insurance commercial like yeah it is. like it's it's pretty wild to know that like some you know, four-year-old Midwestern mom of six just got home from her like second shift on at work and turned on CNN and sees Alex's face on there. That to me is the weirdest and wildest thing with all of that. But well, why did you stop? I stopped because, you know, I'm going to get vulnerable here, but it is a bit of dog eat dog in mm -hmm. this in this industry. And even when you do make it, you don't actually make it until that commercial is playing. Mm. So I got cast in a, a huge, huge commercial. It was with Metro PCS mm -hmm. and they got six um, principal roles. I was one of them, but when they went to filming the commercial, three of the women they chose had a dog in their scenes and then three of us did it. So mm -hmm. in my scene, I was like riding a bike. And when they finally released the commercial, they only used the clips with the dogs because obviously dogs, but that meant that I was out of it. Yeah. And it was so heartbreaking because it happened at the same time that I really needed a financial yeah, surplus yeah. like this, you know, because it, it's almost when you're in commercial acting, it's almost like you're trying to win the lottery. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought I had won the lottery with this one and I have had successfully been in another national commercial before. So I knew what 
what that would be like. So when it aired, I was just, I mean, it, 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 it destroyed me at that point. Now, looking back, I can really appreciate that moment in my life because it made me have to increase my self-worth that I can succeed Mm -hmm. without a lottery ticket. I think that if it either teaches you self-awareness or you recognize that, or I mean, or you, you're toast. Um, but, but that's exact. That's my exact same experience is going through this audition and not just the audition, but then exactly you get to the thing. You're like, yes, I get to be on set. It's magical. You see all the things working and wow, behind the scenes, behind the, behind the scenes, like it is, you're all the way through. And then you're like, man, I can't wait for this to, to air. This is going to be so great. And then it shows up and you're like, they didn't use me. They, what? They didn't, was I not good enough? Was it me? Was it my face? And not only that, now you're dealing with, was it something about me? But you're also like, oh, I actually was kind of banking on that 4K. Like, I, I or whatever it was, right? You're like, wow, no, because I landed the thing. So now, of course, that's what's going to happen. So imagine, like, you know, to relate this, imagine somebody, you go to work for the day, you go for, you, you go to work for the week, Monday to Friday, with the promise or at least the like expectation of a paycheck at the end. And then they're like, actually, we didn't like your work. Sorry, we're going to use somebody else's. Thanks for showing up. Um, we'll give you $100 for each day, but you're not going to get your regular payment. That's what it feels like, right? Yeah, or sometimes it just comes down to the commercials too long and they need to keep it 30 seconds or sure. 50 seconds. And it was tough. It was really tough. And I, I was already... I was already having a lot of daily battles with it. I was like, Hey, I'm a yoga instructor. I'm teaching private lessons to a lot of clients, specifically one I have in mind that was really far in Malibu, but I'd have to weigh out every day. Do I go to this audition or do I go to Malibu and teach this person? That's, I know they're going to pay me and they're going to pay me really well. But if I miss another audition, I'm going to get dropped by the agency. So every day it's a gamble and you feel like you don't have control over your life. I mean, now I feel like if I was doing commercial acting, I would absolutely crush it because there was a part of me that was desperate at that time. I was really literally banking on these Mm -hmm. commercials that were, like I mentioned, like lottery tickets. Um, and on that set specifically, I only did like two or three takes. They were like praising how well I did. And then I saw a couple other girls that just, they had to keep going and going and going. And the director was actually from Venezuela. So he was like talking in Spanish, like she's just not a good actress. She's just not a good right. actress. And I can understand because I speak Spanish. So having that experience as well afterwards, I was like, wait, maybe they thought I was horrible that they didn't even want me to do a fourth, you know, third or fourth take, Mm. but it it was tough. In addition, when you get a no in your life, it is way less painful when it's a, a no that comes soon. This no came like six months later. Like they didn't release the commercial for a long time. Yeah. So I'm like waiting for six months. Okay. I'm going to get this like huge paycheck and royalties and everything, all this stress in my life. At that time, my, my parents had asked me for money and they asked me in a way where if I said no, it was completely okay. But being the people pleaser that I was back then, I was like, I, I'm a failure if I can't give them this. Mm-hmm. So I put all the way of that on this commercial. And of course the universe was like, Nope, like you're way worthier than, than this, you know? Yeah. And, and you're gonna. So there's, <laughs> this is so, it's so good because what, what's, what's just been happening here. Right. So, I mean, we start, let's talk about commercial auditions. Okay, great. But then you're actually opening us up to who you were five years ago. Um, I mean, six, seven years ago as well, kind of through that time, what this needed, you've already, 
implied to us that you've changed since then you would show up differently now and absolutely crush it because you're not who you were and in everything that you're talking about so far you're actually like inviting us into like you're opening a story loop you're saying wait that's not who you were or that's not who you are so what happened in between and that that actually this is where it's so brilliant right because you're like this is this is who i was and let's go back to this moment when specifically i could tell you um yeah i showed up for that this audition you told me about like a really clear moment with this director with and and he saw these other actresses and, and all these these moments that you're highlighting here i just want to i just want to i guess highlight this and and draw attention to the fact that doing this really intentionally is a really good way to draw us in to a further point to say, look, if you find yourself living in this space, feeling like you're just waiting, you all, oh, you've put so much weight on this one decision and you're waiting for that one decision to happen. If you find yourself there and you find yourself like not feeling your own self-worth, I get it. I've been there. But now it's not all dependent on one thing. And I, I know that my worth isn't dependent on somebody else airing my commercial. I know this, I know this, I know this. And I can help you do the same, right? So there's this change that's already taken place. It's like, we don't even need to record the rest of the podcast. But <laughs> <laughs> do you see what I'm talking? Do you see what I'm saying here? And, and, and I'd love to ask you kind of as you're going through this, you know, I don't know how intentional is that for you to, to tell a story in that way? You mean to tell my story of transformation starting yeah. with this moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's definitely a hugely pivotal moment in my life. I mean, mm -hmm. it changed a lot of things. It was a, a mashup of a lot of things as well. It was the commercial and then also going through my worst breakup of my life mm -hmm. at that same time. Mm -hmm. And at the same time that this happened, my ex who him and I were in a really, really negative space, he got in a motorcycle accident mm -hmm. as well. So it was a time where the universe was really just destroying everything I, I thought to be true and forcing me to change. And I even moved to the Pacific Northwest at this time. I was like, I need a whole other state. At, I moved from California to Seattle from, I guess I should say from Los Angeles to Seattle. And I started writing, started writing a novel and this novel was a fiction novel, but it was based on a trip that I took. So it was an elaborate <laughs> creative freedom version of what actually yeah. happened. That's yeah. why it, would, it wouldn't be a memoir. And I guess I should rewind before I moved. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because this is where I want to, I want to, I want to get all of this. And this is so good. And I, um, I'm so fascinated and I think that we all are again, right? So there's this, I could let you keep going. I could let you just kind of go and bounce around wherever we are and try to fill this in. What I'd love to do is see that moment that we're just talking about there, you know, where you're, it's 2016, you've got this commercial thing happening. Your parents are asking you for money. You're going through this terrible breakup. There's this accident, you're moving all of these things happening kind of in succession all around one thing, really highlighting a change needs to happen. So now we're, what I just want to make sure that when often what happens is we'll go back and we will use that as the start of our story. But I would say, right, for you and for most of us, a moment like this, that's not the start. Don't start there. Start before that. Who were you leading up to this? I have no idea why you were in that situation. You're teaching yoga. You're in LA. You're going to commercial. Why are you doing all these things? Who are you? Then you start to write a novel. Like where does all this artistic flair and all this, all this desire, all this wonder and joy and this freedom to just get up and move, even though it's like I had to, 
there's still freedom, right? So there's all of this stuff actually that feeds into all of that, that really matters for who you are to bring us in to, to identify with you. Because as it is, I'm like, well, I've never been to LA. If I wasn't in commercial, I would be like, I don't know. I've never done that. I don't get it. I can listen to you and I'm captivated. But there's actually not very much in there that's, that's relatable. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, okay, let's start here then. What are you doing now? And <laughs> what's the impact that you most want this to make? That, that your work, your main work in this world, what do you see as the impact and, and or what do you want it to be? going forward? Yeah, so I currently am still a yoga instructor. I have my own virtual fitness studio where I teach classes weekly via Zoom. They're live stream classes. And I also Mm -hmm. have an on-demand library. And through the yoga practice, I use this to empower people. It has helped me find myself And now I use it as a way to keep the community going, keep the practice of yoga. And I tend to teach a lot of beginners, a lot of people that would be nervous to enter yoga rooms. So I make it really amazing. And I also teach a lot of men, to be honest, because I'm in the tech world and I started teaching in the past. I have moved away from this with the pandemic, but I was teaching yoga at different tech companies. I taught at Facebook, I taught at Google, I taught at ZipWhip, I taught at a few video game companies. Mm -hmm. So right now, there's still more men that work at those type of companies. And is that like you go in and like on lunch hour? Like, yes, yeah. Hey everybody, like yoga at lunch, everybody go down the slide and we'll meet you there. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Yoga in the ball pit, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I was doing exactly that. And when the world shut down, I took it virtual. And a lot of my regulars from those, those um, environments came to my classes. Great. So I was, so that's how it came to be that there were more tech people in my, in my classes. And that tends to be more men, but women are totally, totally welcome. And so I get, I just want to, I want to just, I know I, man, sometimes I feel like such an ass when I'm interrupting, (laughs) (laughs) but as I said to you before, reserve all the rights and privileges as the podcast host to do so. Um, This is, I write the, like, what do you do now and what's the impact? And I just, I love, because you're such a storyteller, I love the desire to go back and explain you're like, I teach a lot of men because, and you go back to explain that instead of just actually landing here, being like, this is what I do. And it sounds heartless almost. It's like, I just want to know what you do. And I just want to know why, like start there. And I think that this is a thing. A lot of us actually get caught up in that. We're like, I can't even explain what I do to people because you're trying to fill in all of this. But if they're literally just asking, what do you do and why? Okay. Just go here. Don't go back. So yeah. I'd say from here forward, what do you see this looking like? What is this and what impact? Does that help? Okay. Yeah, that helps a lot. So I teach virtually. I teach yoga classes virtually to empower yeah. people to feel like their most authentic self and to just phys- physically feel good mentally, emotionally as well. Yeah. I also teach other instructors or business owners, how to use software and empower them to have their own business as well. Brilliant. See, (laughs) and so then, okay. So now if you do that, as you do that, you empower people to, to, to show up authentically business owners to, to start their own businesses. Is that, was that it to really look at their own like tech to focus on the tech side? Yeah. So I teach I teach business owners how to use software tools to automate their business. So they're not using Venmo and spreadsheets like Google sheets. And what happens when they do that? Like, how do they feel after, you know, as, as they, wow, you show them the, 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 the magic of it. Um, Then what, what difference does that make? They feel from, from being like self-proclaimed, not tech savvy, 
they go from that journey to feeling like this is so easy. Wow. And they also will ask a question and they'll say, this is a silly question because they start to realize that yeah. it's actually accessible. And I, of course, I'll, there's no silly question, but yeah, I, I love tech and software. And it's interesting. That is kind of the bridge. I started teaching yoga at tech companies and it made me want to be involved more than just teaching yoga. So this is what's fascinating to me where I see you've got this movement side of you, this very kind of, I would say at yoga, right. To be a yogi, there's like a fluidity to life. I think from at least any that I've met um, seems very right brain, very artistic, very right. kind of feel and emotional and feminine energy. And then you've got this tech side, which is beep, boop, boop. Like here's your, you know, um, your numbers and your, um, binary, like it's, this is, it's math. This is left. This is logic. Like, let's get to it. And you seem to be merging those together in a professional way. Like, is that, do you recognize that? Are you wait, do you wake up every day? You're like, yeah, I guess, well, here I am. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But it's once you start to live a life like this, you realize that it's not that unusual. Steve Jobs. Yeah. was someone like this but we only saw the the hard ass like the logical saw, side yeah we only saw the black turtleneck yeah and the product releases and him lowering his voice mm-hmm. um <laughs> very good but 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 to think to to think different right apple's original kind of catchphrase this is that outside the box thinking that yeah. drove them to, to create what they created. Yeah. He went to India. Yeah. He had a guru. He, he planned his own funeral and in his funeral, every person that attended got the book, the autobiography, excuse me, autobiography of a yogi. Huh. I did not know this. So that wasn't in the movie jobs. Um <laughs> <laughs> Well, all those movies are too soon. <laughs> right. The best, the best picture I got of Steve Jobs was actually in, um, it's in, uh, was it Bob Iger's uh, kind of memoir, the, the CEO of Disney. And he talks about his relationship with Steve and, and how they, they became very close ultimately because Bob like was bold enough to ask Steve to like, you know, work together and to buy something, whatever happened to buy Pixar, whatever deal went down at that time, um, that he was one of the first people that Steve Jobs admitted he had cancer to, um, sitting on a park bench outside the Pixar studios. And like, so that to me kind of showed me actually a better picture of who that man is than the movies, um, et cetera. But Hey, here we go. Apparently he was deep into yoga as well. You, though, <laughs> the future female Steve Jobs, we, uh, you are showing up today, and this is what's this is where I see the story. All really, if this is where you are, and we were just highlighting this key middle point that we'll come back to. It's almost like okay, well now, like, where did all this begin? Where the idea that you can do this, that you should show up and help people move and be more in touch with their bodies. Ultimately, where does this idea that things are easier than you think show up, whether it's easier, whether it's, it's this sense of ease or authenticity, I'm not sure where that is, but you said both of those words and um, what, what comes up early moments, childhood, like growing up, what comes up as I say, those things like, Life is, life should be easier. Things should be easier. Uh, Is that how you grow up? Is that something that you desired growing up? Where does that begin? I totally desired that growing up. Mm -hmm. I am someone that I don't, I don't really get depression um, often. No, excuse me. Anxiety is what I meant to say. I don't often get anxiety often, but 
I do tend naturally, which you're probably going to be shocked, but naturally I am more an angry person Hmm. and depressed. Um, That's the two things that I would lean towards if I was going through a rough time. And I grew up really, really angry, feeling like the world was very unfair because at the time growing up, I didn't know anyone that was more poor than my family. Of course they exist, but when you're a kid, you just think all of my friends are not as poor as me. And I'm embarrassed to have people at my house. Right. So I was very, very angry growing up because I didn't understand why I had to be the poor kid. What did that, I mean, you can, whether you can explain it now, or could you explain it as a kid? Like what? what led to that? What led to your financial situation or social, uh, you know, status? What was the the cause of that? Well, at the time, my mom didn't speak English and they had come from Mexico to the United States. So I'm first generation American Mm -hmm. and I'm their first, their first daughter, their first child. So Mm -hmm. I had a role as one of the parents almost um, because I would be translating for them. I would like fill out my own waivers or whatever I needed for school. And I remember, and I, I feel like honestly like such an asshole now, but I remember getting so mad at my mom and being like, why can't you help me with my homework? Everybody else's parents help them with their homework. So it was, it was really intense. (laughs) So was there, so then as you grow up through that, was there always this like, um, desire to get out? As you say, like, you're just angry at your situation. Um, sometimes that would show up as anger towards people, towards your parents, but then was it, right? You're in high school. Are you like, I got to get out of this place? Like, oh, I'm, I'm, 1, you know, when I grow up. Yeah. 1000%. Yeah. I was like, I don't even know what I want to study in college, but I need to get out. Cause that's the only way I'm going to get out. So I applied. So to- what did you lean towards? What was the, okay, but I'm going to go to college. So then you actually at some point have to apply. So what did you kind of go towards? Yeah. And I did apply. And actually when I was applying, my dad had, my dad and I had one of our biggest fights ever because this is actually also sad. He didn't want me to go to college because he was so worried about, he didn't want me to get excited if I got accepted Mm -hmm. because they didn't know how they would pay for it. So at the time they weren't aware of financial aid and things like that, but I had taken in high school, a class that taught me all those things. And then I went and talked to my counselor. So even though I was angry at that time in my life and the kind of in victimization mode, I also look back and I'm like, wow, I still was really proactive. <laughs> um, and, and that makes me feel, feel happy because back then we didn't have the same tools that, you know, everything's online now. You can just search. You had to actually yeah. go to see your counselor and <laughs> ask yeah. these questions. actually talk to humans face to face yes um so it took a lot of courage so looking back now I I give that younger angry version of myself credit as well but I ended up applying to like five California state universities I got into a few of them but I ended up going to the one that was the closest to my parents house it was California State University Sacramento an hour away So that if anything happened, I couldn't afford to live on my own. I could move back and Mm -hmm. commute to school. Um, And what it like, you're like, this is what I'm going to go study. What did you want? Like, what were you like? Okay, I'm going to learn this because it will lead to something else. What what did you actually jump into? Well, that took me forever. (laughs) I did not know what to study. I think I probably put psychology first because I was like, I'm an angry person. How do I fix myself? (laughs) And 
and then I started doing um, all the general education classes, which you, that gives you about a year and a half, two years of buffer time. I ended up going with international and intercultural communication studies. Mm-hmm. At the time, there were a couple professors in that department that were just really captivating for me. One of them was known to be really mean, but he spent so much time in Thailand and he did a a bunch of research around the cultural value difference from Thailand and the United States. And he talked a lot about individualistic um, culture values and community culture values. And it was just really intriguing to me to see how these values shift everything and how people behave. So I got drawn into that. And then there was another professor that talked about topics that I just, they seemed a little bit taboo, but for example, he was, he had a class that was, the name was terrorism. It was like communication Mm -hmm. terrorism. And I learned about Um, everything that was going on in Belfast and he just changed you know he's like terrorism really started in Europe started in Ireland you know he's like we have a drink called Irish car bomb like that is that was from terrorism (laughs) Jameson's in Guinness (laughs) (laughs) yeah and and it was just intriguing to me to these are topics that I had never ever they weren't even on my radar things, you know, to, to discuss or to even question or wonder about. And so I decided to do communication studies, specifically international and intercultural. And I started thinking about traveling and my heritage. So I studied abroad in Spain for a year. And that is really where the creativity came from. So all this time, I mean, what is that? 23, 20, I don't know, 20, how old are you then? 20? Um, um, yeah, it was this was from like 18 to 23. Right. So, so all this time growing up, you're living in a situation going day by day. You're like, this sucks. I recognize this sucks. I'm, I see what other people have and I don't have that. I feel like we can't get out of this. My parents don't see a way out of this. They actually are trying to hold me back to protect me. I mean, if that isn't a picture of fear, I don't know what is like this image that like, no, don't apply for that thing. Because if you get it, we might not be able to afford it. How many of us are not making a choice in our life because we're afraid of not being able to you know, to pay up when it happens. Um, but that's not, obviously that's just fear trying to protect us, but it it's holding us back. So you show up and you do this, you find your way out, you break out. You're like, I'm going to do internet. Of course you're going to do international cultural and communication studies because it's just broadening the world even more. It's like this expansiveness, this opening up to like, Whoa, what is going on? My world was so small. And it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you go. It's like my world is so tight. There's a lot of frustration I hear in this, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it carried over into college because even then, you know, everyone's parents like knew all the things and their parents were like alum and all this stuff. Like, I guess I was like, I was in extreme imposter syndrome in my life. I just lived like an imposter. I remember, this is like really sad. (laughs) I remember sometimes like pretending like I got certain gifts because I was too embarrassed to say that I didn't get those gifts in Christmas, like everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, I'm not a liar. I'm not a liar, but it was too embarrassing. Mm -hmm. It was too big to be like, oh, I didn't like, I just got pajamas. (laughs) Do you, do you still find yourself doing something similar to that? Pretending that you've got something, have something, or did you lose that? Have have you let that go along the way? I let that go. I did. And one of the most beautiful aspects about getting older is that I've 
I'm so close to my parents. I appreciate them. I love my culture. I'm actually sitting in Mexico city right now. Mm -hmm. Lifelong dream, dream of mine to come here to Mexico city. And yeah, I, I, I let that go because through the yoga, the yoga was the healing of all of this. And that's when I realized that these stories would actually connect me to the people I need to have in my life. If someone yeah, were yeah. to judge me because I, you know, didn't get that shiny toy when Christmas, mm-hmm. <laughs> when you're a kid, you can't, you can't handle it. That's like the worst. Yeah. Um, but now as an adult, I'm like, if someone were to judge me for that, it's okay. They just don't need to be in my life. Yeah. So there's still a gap in the story, right? There's still this like, okay, you went to Spain and then how many years was it between Spain and this other moment that we were talking about? Like 2016 ish, like when the years were, so Spain ended in 2010 Okay. And after I got back, I was like, no, I just lived the best year of my life. My life's ruined. <laughs> and one of my friends was like, one of my best friends to this day, Jacqueline, shout out to her. She was like, you should. And it's funny because we actually met at a photo shoot that was awful, but we, we love each other. We're like, you were so worth that awful day. But <laughs> she, she told me at that awful photo shoot, you should try yoga. Like the specific style of yoga, hot yoga is like so popular and it'll help you with, with that depression you're feeling and like sadness you're feeling that, that you're no longer in Madrid. That's what started the, the yoga journey. And a year later, what were you looking for specifically when she's like, you won't have that anymore. What were you hoping that you would have? Um, presence presence and gratitude. I was feeling, I was feeling like I, the best year of my life had passed because Europe was just so, it was so expansive for me and I had never gone that far. I, I was there for a whole entire year. Like I think my visa was 365 days and I stayed like 363 days. Um, so, so I was, hoping to just not feel like I was constantly living in the past or comparing my current situation to my past situation. So you give yoga a shot and you're like this, because this is what's so interesting to me. I'm actually going to record a solo episode right after this, talking about this, that will have actually come out before this episode, a little weird time travel thing. Here we go. But it's about this idea that, that what you wanted, you know, you went to yoga, not because your friend was like hot yoga. Don't you want to sweat? You're like, no, no, no. I want to go because I want to change in state. We, we, we do things. We make choices specifically. We pay because we want to change. We want transformation. And that's why I'm so bullish on this and people's stories that it's not just a journey. It's there's an actual transformation that happened. And the more clear that you can get on that, the more likely people are going to come and actually work with you and buy what you're selling, because that's all that we want. We just want to change from something to something else. And it's fascinating to me that in your story, you've got this frustrated way of life. Even that you said, to be in the present, not live in the past. What's in the, it's frustration that I'm not there anymore. And so you lean into yoga and it gives you what, I mean, over years, like enough, it gave you something enough to actually do the training yourself and say, I got to teach other people this. What did you find? Well, it's interesting that you just gave that recap because I realized that I went to yoga for emotional and mental reasons. And most people don't do that. They go to yoga so they could be more flexible, more limber so that their body can look a certain way or feel a certain way. 
So you just made me realize that I kind of skipped ahead. <laughs> Usually the, the emotional and mental part, those benefits yeah. are kind of just like positive side effects, but people, I mean, I've had people tell me like, oh, I don't own, I'm just here because my hamstrings are tight. Like, right. I don't want to own, I don't want to meditate, like just yeah. show me the stretches. So I kind of was in reverse, but what I found, I mean, the results were astounding. I, I could not believe, first of all, the first class that I took, I was like, internally, I was like cussing out the instructor. I was like, this is horrible. It smells like feet in here. It's so hot. I can't breathe. I'm going to die. Like, who is this guy? Like, I'm never uh -huh. coming back. And I came back like 10 days in a row. <laughs> right. But the first three days were just like that. They were so hard. And I just like was cussing inside in my head. And on the fourth day, I was like, okay, that was still pretty awful, but I feel great leaving. Like yeah, afterwards, yeah. I started to feel awesome. And the reason why I kept going back every day is because I bought like an intro offer of 10 days. And after that fourth day just kept getting better and better but this kind of yoga was very very strict and you had to do like the same poses every time and I I think what I was getting is like satisfaction that I was doing hard things huh. that I was doing something that was hard for me and I don't think that and wow you're like making me realize a lot of things sometimes if not always when I'm feeling depressed is because I'm not being challenged. And when I was in Europe, I was being challenged. Yeah. I went to Germany by myself and I could not find my hostel. And then I found it. And it was like, after a lot of like asking around and looking at a like actual paper map, <laughs> yeah. um, but I was challenged in Europe. And I think that the yoga brought that challenge back into my life. <laughs> and then, so this is like, let's put a bow on this, right? Cause then I love, I love those moments. You gotta, you gotta hear me. Yes. My goodness. This is the magic. This is why I do what I do. When somebody says to me, they're going through their story and they're like, oh, this is the first time I've realized this. It's such a sacred moment, actually, I believe. And I want to thank you for sharing that right here, for sharing that with anyone listening. Um, this is the beauty of going through it openly and honestly, and just sort of not judging any of it, just talking it through. And you see what shows up. And this element of challenge is something that you've actually desired in your life. Um, and so then you show up and you're like, all right, why not acting? Let's give that a shot. That sounds fun. And then you get into it and then it hits you and whatever other challenges then came, how did you shift? You know, what did that, what came up for you? Let's go back to the kind of 2016. I know I'm filling in a bunch of the story here, but then you came back to this point of you were writing a novel and you wanted to kind of fill that out for us to bring us to where we are now. So Take us to there. Yeah. So, so I decided I was reading a Paulo Coelho book and <laughs> I was reading this book. Alchemist? No, it was uh, the Zahir. And okay. I was reading this and I was thinking like, wow, his life is, or the story that's being told in this book is not that unusual. It's pretty relatable. It, it, there are some elements that one can say are unusual, but the actual like story, it was so relatable. Yeah, and yeah. it made me realize that my life, I was like, wait, my life sounds even crazier than this. I was like, maybe I should write about it. And once I had that idea, I couldn't get it out of my mind. And that's usually how I make decisions when I have something in my mind and heart and it, it just won't go away. I follow that. And as I briefly mentioned earlier, I, I used to be a people pleaser. I still lean towards that, but I, I worked through it a ton. Um, and so I started writing this novel and it took me a few years to complete. 
And as soon as I completed it, my desire to publish it, and I, I'm interested to see what you have to say about this, but my desire to publish it just completely went away. As hmm. soon as I finished it, I was like, I closed it and I was like, wait, mm -hmm. this is the first thing in my life that I've done just for myself. Nobody knew that I was going to the coffee shop every single day, having the best time writing this book and also a really hard time some days. Like it wasn't something that was on social media that people were just like giving me that yeah. instant gratification. It was zero instant gratification. Yeah. And it really helped me increase my self-worth to, I mean, so much. And I, I really think that was like my therapy, writing that novel. I have a very clear thought on that. I just want to know what the resolution, how did the character change in the novel? What happened to the main character? Like how did they end up? I guess she ended spoiler. up spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> she ended up whole mm. and she ended up knowing that she is worthy of everything that she desires, independent of a man or a romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. And she also learned that when things break, they don't have to stay broken. Oh my God. That's a good stuff. <laughs> so, okay. First thought on that. I'm not surprised. Uh, I think it'd be great to publish it now and at a place where you're like, I'm not depending on this, but maybe people want to read it. Um, a lot of this work, what I recognize, a lot of people come to me and hire me as a coach because they're like, I need to get my brand story straight. I'm like, yeah, great. Absolutely. I can help you find that so you can show up on Instagram and attract people to your, your business. hundred percent. I can do that with expertise. What happens is uh, inevitably you will develop empathy for yourself first. And this is the thing we, we look at this and if anybody's like, thinking of like, I need, I need the work done. I need to, to present my story better. That's how I need to know what I should say. That's the what, but the work is really in the why. And when you actually do this work, you first, you've got to have empathy for your own story. You've got to fall in love with yourself before you can show anybody that you might possibly have empathy for where they're at. You can't have empathy for the world unless you empathize with your own story first. And I think what you did was think, I'm going to do this to help other people. But by diving in, you actually rewrote your story. You wrote your story with the ending that you desire and you actually cared about it. You saw this person, you saw her develop and change in the same, again, empathetic, compassionate way that you at your very best would see your life changing as well. So you created empathy for yourself and you realized, wow, that was the mission here. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as that, that book and that, that part of my life was complete, that's when I started going for the bigger yoga clients, the corporation, mm. the tech companies, and even manifesting the job that I have now in, yeah. at a software company. So yours, this is magical. Yours is a story that I hear of you growing up in a, again, feeling trapped, feeling small, feeling frustrated and choosing to open up that world and choose your, make your own path. Even when everything around you was trying to hold you back, you chose to open that up to change your world. And through frustrations, you still found that shift ultimately through yoga when it wasn't the trip in Spain. It was when you came back and your friend said, you should try yoga. And you were like, wow, even in the frustration of going day after day, day four was a transformative moment for you. Something happened where you realized I feel different. That feeling different then led you to explore that more and trans help to lead and teach other people through this and always seek how to help other people move from frustrated to 
free, really. Frustrated to open because that's what you're living now. Whole, you said whole. The, the way that she ended the story was whole. There's this disconnected to wholeness that you're feeling now. And that is something that no matter what you're doing, I hear whether you're teaching a class, Yesi and yoga and helping people come in and be feel more whole in their self, or yeah, you're working with Jim, the IT guy on how he shouldn't use Venmo anymore. He's, <laughs> he's feeling like he's being run off his feet and you're like, it's easier than you think. Let's just simplify this. There's a wholeness to that. There's something that you love about your own life, about the challenge. You love the challenge. There's something to explore in that. But what I hear in your story is something about going from disconnected to whole. And that's what you're inviting anybody who comes across your path to, um, to go through as well. How's that sound? That sounds like it's on point. That's the most I could ask. That's beautiful. So if somebody wants that, they want to get to know you, they want to talk with you more, they want to, they want to learn from you um, and, and take your classes to work with you in some way, then uh, to find wholeness in their life. They want to beg you to publish, to publish your book. Uh, where are they going to find you? What's the best way to connect with you to actually start that conversation? Yeah, my website is yesichavez.com. You can take yoga, yoga classes with me every week live and we can chat before and after class. You can also take some of my recordings if you prefer to kind of ease into it at your own time or reach out to me on Instagram. It's yesicht. Excellent. I love it. Obviously, uh, I knew this was going to be a great conversation and it did not disappoint we, I still feel like we just scratched the surface on your story. And yet, thank you for going to the depths that you did. And again, for opening up and being authentic and, and vulnerable with us. Um, I'm, I'm so excited for where you're at and where you're going. And I'm grateful for your time here today. Thanks, Yessie. Thank you.